we're going to be looking at several demonstrations of, uh, that have to do with center of mass and how the position of the center of mass of an object is related to the object's stability. Let's begin with a parlor trick that you've probably seen before. Take a fork and a spoon, interlock them, slip a match in between the tines of the fork and balance it on a glass, or in this case, a beaker. And you can make the whole combination balance there. The reason that works is because the center of mass of the system of the fork and the spoon is actually right at the lip of the beaker where it's balanced. So the point of support is directly below the center of mass. The reason the center of mass is at that particular point, it's not actually within the fork or the spoon. It's somewhere here below it. Now, by symmetry, since the fork and the spoon are about the same shape, the center of mass is going to be along a line approximately here. But because the spoon extends way out and the fork extends way out, uh, this will displace the center of mass downward. And so the center of mass of an object does not actually have to be physically within the object. Let's look at another example. Here we'll be using our two-dimensional NCSSM student. We'll call this 2D. And I'm going to put some weight on 2D's hands and balance 2D right there on the top of the head. It's very easy to balance. Um, now like the fork and the spoon, we've got a lot of weight on the outside extending out away from the point of support. Because of the symmetry of the object, the center we can know the center mass will fall on a on a vertical line right here below my finger. And it's going to be quite a ways down because most of the weight is here in the clamps. Now this is a very stable object. So next we want to talk about why it is that this is stable and what the position of the center of mass has to do with that. I'll begin by looking at a different object where it might be a little bit easier to see what's going on. I'll just use this. Um, this is a support for another piece of equipment. It has a wooden base and just a metal rod. Sitting like this, it's very stable. It's very hard to make this thing tip over. But if I put it like this, it's, about, it's essentially impossible to keep it from tipping over. That has to do with what happens to the center of mass when the object tips. The center of mass of this object is inside the piece of wood. In order to tip the object, notice that the center of mass has to rise first. It's going to rise before it finally starts to fall over again. It has to rise quite a large distance. On the other hand, if the object is like this, the center of mass is now up here. And as the object starts to tip, the center of mass immediately begins be, uh, going downward. So the difference is that um, if the center of mass has to be lifted, then the object is going to be more stable than if it just falls immediately. And the farther it has to be lifted, then the more stable the object will be. Now let's take a look at 2D one more time. The center of mass of 2D is way down here because that's where most of the weight is. So I would actually have to pull this to the side like so in order to raise the center of mass. And in fact, I couldn't even raise the center of mass far enough in order to make the object tip over completely. On the other hand, if I put most of the mass above like this, now the center of mass of 2D will be up here. It will be above my finger. So as soon as I let go, the center of mass will fall immediately. And it would be impossible for me to balance without moving my finger. And even then, it's very difficult. Now, there are a number of toys that work on this principle. Here's one of them. This horseman has the, the horseman is plastic. But there's a fairly heavy weight here on the end. So the center mass is going to be down in here. Very, actually, the center mass might be somewhere within the weight here on the end, or at least very near to it. We have no trouble balancing this on its platform. The center mass is way down here below it. In order to make this thing tip over, we'd have to raise the center mass above this point, and of course, that would be impossible without practically pushing it off of its stand. Here's another toy that works similarly. It's a bald-headed eagle. And this one can be balanced on its beak. 
Now, if you want to try this yourself and don't have toys like this at home, it's very simple. All you need is a pencil with an eraser and a paper clip. Open up the paper clip. Stick one end in the pencil eraser. And you can balance the other end on your finger. So the center mass will fall on a straight line directly below my finger. In this demonstration, we're going to see how to find the center of mass of an irregularly shaped object. For the object, we're going to use the state of North Carolina. In order to help with this, I'll be using this piece of equipment. There's a nut tied to a string with a pin tied on the end. What I'll be doing is using this string with this pin and a weight attached to it together with the map so that I can suspend the map from the pin and see where the uh, string falls. So I'll begin by putting the pin here. This can be anywhere, but I'm just picking somewhere around Elizabeth City. I hold the end of the pin so that the map is suspended from my hand. So this means that the center of mass of the map will be somewhere along this vertical line. With a marker, I'll draw the line on there. It's kind of a rough line, but you get the idea. So we know the center of mass falls somewhere on that line, but we don't know where. In order to find out, we need to draw a second line to intersect with the first. So to do that, I'll put the pen in somewhere else, somewhere up here around Boone. Suspend it once more. Draw another line. And that's enough to find the center of mass, which should be the intersection of those two. But just for good measure, we'll do it one more time to see if the third line also points, uh, passes through that point. So I'll put this somewhere down around Wilmington. And I don't have to draw the line for you to see that the string is passing very near that intersection point. So no matter where I put that pin, it should pass through that particular point. And let's see where that is. It turns out that it's very close to the city of Sanford. So if that really is the center of mass of North Carolina, then I should be able to balance the entire state on that particular point. Now, when I said that Sanford was the center of mass of the state of North Carolina, I was talking about this cutout of the state. Actually, the center of mass is, is uh, influenced by the distribution of mass in the object. And for North Carolina, we know we have mountains to the west, and so that's going to increase the mass on the western end. And we have bodies of water distributed throughout the state in various places. Uh, so all of these will affect the actual center of mass of the state of North Carolina. We're going to be looking at the forces acting on an object in equilibrium. And the object is going to be this garbage gobbler truck on this inclined plane. The plane is inclined at an angle of 30 degrees with the horizontal. There's also a bumper back here which keeps the truck from falling backwards. Now these strings and these pulleys, we're going to find out later what they're for. But for now, we're just going to ignore those. Let's take a uh, close look at the forces that are acting on the truck in this situation. First, we know that because it's in equilibrium, that the forces acting on it add up to zero. There are three forces. Those forces are the weight of the truck downward, pointing to the center of the Earth. The bumper exerts a force parallel to the plane, pointing like this. And the plane exerts a force perpendicular to the plane, like this. That's a normal force. 
those three forces add up to zero. Now let's take a closer look at those forces and how they depend upon the angle of the plane. And for that I'm going to use this setup because it's a little bit smaller and I can move it around. So here's the bumper and here's the plane and here's the car instead of the truck. In this situation where the plane is horizontal, we don't need the bumper force to keep the car there. I can put the car anywhere that I want to and it will stay. Uh, so we just have two forces, the normal force of the plane up, the weight force down, those two forces are equal and opposite. Now I'm going to tilt the plane up more and more and more to get as, uh, up to uh, a vertical angle for the plane, or a 90 degree angle, and you can see when I approach 90 that that plane is not exerting any force on the uh, car anymore. All the force is being exerted by the bumper, there's a bumper force up and then the weight force down, and so now those two forces are equal and opposite to each other. Well, for any angle in between, there will be both a bumper force and a plane force, a normal force from the plane, but those two forces will depend upon the angle. So we're going to see uh, in the segment that follows exactly how those forces depend upon the angle of the plane. We'll begin, like always, by representing the object, the truck, by a point. There are three forces acting on the truck. The weight of the truck, which acts vertically downward, that's mg. The normal force, which acts perpendicular to the plane and away from it, that's n. And the force of the bumper, which acts parallel to the plane and upward along the plane, we'll call that f. We need to set up x and y axes. It's convenient for that purpose to set up an x-axis parallel to the plane. We'll have plus x pointed upward along the plane, and a y-axis perpendicular to the plane, we'll have the plus y-axis pointed upward away from the plane. Now we need to look at the components of the weight force along the x and y axes. Those will be along the y-axis, this component, along the x-axis, this component. To determine what those components are, we need to know this angle. And in order to obtain that angle, we can relate it to the angle that the plane makes with the horizontal, call that theta. In order to make the relationship, I'm going to extend a couple of lines. I'll extend the y-axis until it crosses the ground. I'll extend the weight force until it does the same thing. Now let's look at a couple of angles. The two angles are the angle of the plane with the horizontal and the angle of the weight force with the y-axis. Notice that both sides of those two angles are perpendicular to each other. The weight force is perpendicular to the ground. and the y-axis is perpendicular to the plane. There's a theorem from geometry that states if two angles have their corresponding sides perpendicular, those angles are either equal or supplementary. In this case, we can see that they are equal. So that means that the angle we're interested in is the same as the angle theta. Knowing that, we can then write that the component of the weight force along the y-axis is the side adjacent to our angle theta, and therefore it is mg cosine theta. And the component of mg down the plane is the side opposite the angle theta, and that is mg sine theta. Now both of those components are in the negative direction. mg cosine theta is in the negative y direction, so I'll put a minus sign in front of it. mg sine theta is in the negative x direction, so I'll put a negative in front of it. Now we're ready to write the net force equations. The net force along the x-axis is composed of two forces, F, which is positive, and minus mg sine theta. And the net force along the y-axis, also composed of two forces, and those are N, which is a positive force, and mg cosine theta, which is negative. So that gives us two net force equations that we can use to complete the analysis of this situation. Now that you've seen the equations for the forces, uh, we're going to take some measurements so uh, that you can do some calculations. In order to do that, uh, I'm going to replace the uh, normal force of the plane and the bumper force with two other forces. I'm going to replace the uh, force of the bumper with a tension force exerted by this string. And I'll do that by putting the string over the pulley here and hanging a weight on the end of the string. I'm not going to do that now. I just wanted you to see it. And notice that the string is pretty nearly parallel to the plane. Uh, and I do that because the bumper force is also acting parallel to the plane. 
Now, in order to replace the normal force, that force is perpendicular to the plane. This string will replace the normal force of the plane. And notice that it's perpendicular to the plane, just like the normal force would be. And I'll drape it over a pulley, and I'll put a weight on this side. Now, if we knew the mass of the truck, then we could calculate what those uh, two uh, weights on the side had to be hanging over the pulleys in order to replace the normal force of the plane and the bumper force. Now, I know what the mass is, and so I already know what those weights are. Uh, I'm going to have you work backwards, though. I'm going to put the weights on there. I'm going to tell you what they are, and then your job will be to use the equations for the forces to calculate what the mass of the truck is. So I'm going to put those on right now. This particular mass is a total of uh, 0.265, or rather 0 0.270 kilograms. Now that's a mass, and we're interested in a weight because that's a force, and that is what provides us the tension force in the string here. So you'll need to convert that mass into a weight using the acceleration due to gravity. On this side, there's a total mass of uh, 0.465 kilograms. And when I hang that on there, Notice that the truck moves ever so slightly. You can see that the planes are not needed anymore to support it. I'm going to pull them away. And also the bumper is not needed either. And so the truck hangs there in the same uh, orientation as if it were on the plane. But we've uh, simply replaced the bumper force with the tension force of this string and the normal force of the plane with the tension force of this string. Your job now is to take the two measurements that I've given you and the equations that you have and calculate the mass of the truck. And then uh, you'll come back and take another look at the video and uh, find out, we'll measure the mass on a balance and compare to what you came up with. Now that you've calculated the mass, we'll find the mass on this scale and compare values. It's more than 500. I'll put that on 500 grams. And this one is on 40. And that's just about right. So we're going to call the mass of the truck 0 0.540 kilograms. Now you shouldn't expect to get exactly that value because there are some sources of error in this experiment. The strings may not have been exactly perpendicular and parallel to the plane. That's probably the biggest source of error. Another one is that the pulleys, even though that they move pretty freely, they do have some friction. And that friction actually helps out the weights hanging over the end, so they don't have to be as much in order to support the truck. Now, if you were off by more than about, say, 20 grams uh, between the value on the mass and the value you calculated, then you may have made a mistake in your calculation. So go back and take another look at those. Now we're going to look at Newton's first law in a different way than we've been doing. Up until now, we've been looking at objects moving in a straight line, either speeding up or slowing down or staying at the same speed. But Newton's, law, Newton's first law deals in general with objects whose velocity may or may not be changing. We know that velocity is a vector and has both a magnitude and direction. And so in this demonstration, we're going to look at changes in direction. Uh, again, Newton's first law says that an object either remains at rest or in a state of constant velocity unless acted upon by a net external force. In this particular case, we're going to look at a force causing the object to change its velocity by changing its direction. We do this by swinging an object in a circle. We're going to use bungee man here uh, for the object that we're going to swing in a circle. And as it swings in a circle, as you know, its velocity vector is always tangent to the path. And so that direction is always changing as bungee man swings. Now let's take a look at the force which is causing that direction to change. The force must be coming somehow from the elastic here. And in fact, you can see how big that force is, or you can estimate how big it is, just by seeing how much this is stretched. So I'm going to start swinging bungee man like this, 
where it's not stretched very much. But as you see as I swing faster and faster, that uh, the cord will stretch more and more. Let's, let's go down here slow to begin with. And then speed it up. And so you can see that more and more force is being applied. And that force is being applied first by my hand to the uh, spring, and then by the spring uh, to Bungee Man. And that force is a force which is pulling inward on Bungee Man toward the center of the circle. So in conclusion, what we've seen is that by applying a net external force, in this case, to the center of the circular path, we're able to change the direction of an object's velocity vector. We're going to be looking at collisions where the objects stick together during the collision. Now I'll demonstrate the collisions and get some data and later you'll use that data in order to uh, determine whether momentum and kinetic energy are conserved in these collisions. We're using the same setup as in the past, a low friction track. The track has been leveled so that the gliders don't have a tendency to drift one way or the other. They move along it with fairly low friction, but they, do, they will slow down a little bit so it's not completely frictionless. On each glider, there's a uh, post-it note which is taped there, and the purpose of the post-it note is to trigger the photogate timer as it passes through, and that's how we measure the velocities of the carts. And you may have noticed it was a little bit difficult to pull these apart. The, the w reason they stick is because there's Velcro on the front of them. I don't know if you can see it, but uh, there's a piece of Velcro on each side, and the opposite kind on each side of this one and so they will stick. So for each collision, one cart is going to be stationary to begin with. I'm going to make it this cart right here, so it'll sit right there just in front of one photogate and this cart just to the uh, outside of the other photogate. The reason I chose the position like this is uh, almost immediately after the collision occurs, this uh, post-it note will pass through the photogate. So, if there is any slowing down of the cars due to friction, it's not going to have time to slow down very much after that collision. So that minimizes the error due to friction. And for the same reason, this photogate is close to the other one, so that almost immediately after this post-it note passes completely through, it collides with the other cart. In fact, I can probably move that just a little bit closer. So that will minimize the error due to friction, and we should get better data. So I'll begin by zeroing both of the photo gates and position this and give this a push. And let's see what the uh, photo gates read. This one is 0.158 seconds and this one is 0 0.077 seconds. All right, well now what I'm going to do is put different amounts of mass in the carts and get some more data. So I'll take one of these bars. Now each bar is half of a kilogram and each of the carts is half of a kilogram. So that makes this cart now one full kilogram with the load on it. This one is still a half. Get that one ready. Reset the photo gates. Here goes. And the uh, time readings are on this one 0 0.110 seconds and on this one 0 0.070 seconds. All right, let's change the bar to the other cart. So now this is one kilogram, this is half a kilogram. Reset the gates. Collision number three. Now that one you can see slowed down quite a bit. So there might be a significant influence due to friction that you have to worry about. Okay, the time on this is 0.239 seconds. And on this one is 0 0.071 seconds. Now you may have noticed that this flag was going through the photo gate too. So this flag went through first and then it was followed by that one. And why doesn't this flag simply add to the time that was already there and give us um, an incorrect reading? Uh, the reason is that the timer actually it will stop after the first photo gate goes through and it will not record the time for the second flag. 
It'll keep that in memory, so if we wanted to find out what it was, we could find out. But uh, it doesn't actually display that. So that's how we can get away with that. Okay, I'm going to put another uh, bar on this cart and move this bar over to here. So now this is a kilogram and a half. This is half a kilogram. Three times the ma this cart is three times the mass of that one. All right, reset. And the times are 0 0.109 seconds, 0 0.078 seconds. Let's do one more collision. I'll take my last bar and put it on this one. So now we've got a kilogram here, a kilogram and a half there. Reset. And the times are 0.159 seconds and 0 0.087 seconds. So with the data that you have, the times for each collision and the width of the flag, which uh, by the way is uh, 5.0 centimeters or 0 0.050 meters, and the masses of the carts, uh, you'll be able to determine whether momentum and kinetic energy are conserved in these collisions. We're going to be investigating the motion of this uh, toy fighter jet, which strangely enough is propeller driven. Um, we're going to determine the speed of the jet in two different ways. In one method, we're going to look at the forces acting on the airplane and use Newton's laws and uh, figure out the acceleration and the speed that way. In the second method, we'll measure the velocity directly simply by finding out how far the jet travels in a certain period of time and dividing the distance by the time. And then we'll compare the two methods. So one measurement that we're going to have to have in order to do this is the length of the string that the uh, airplane is hanging from. So let's take that first before we put this uh, airplane back into motion again. I'll just put a meter stick up beside the string. We'll start with it right from the pivot point and it comes almost down to the uh, airplane but not quite. It takes another probably couple of centimeters we'll estimate to get to the middle of the airplane. So that's a total of 102 centimeters or 1.02 meters. Now let's take a look at the theory before we actually take the measurements. Let's look at the forces acting on the airplane from the side. Here the, we have the weight of the airplane. I'll just call that mg. It's mass times the acceleration due to gravity. And the string pulls on it with a tension force. Well, vertically, these are the only two forces acting on the uh, airplane. And we want to combine these and do a net force analysis in order to determine uh, the velocity of the airplane. And to get the velocity, we need to know its acceleration. So first of all, we know that the airplane is moving in a horizontal circle, and that when objects move in circles, their acceleration is centripetal and it's directed to the center of the circle. So the acceleration vector of the airplane is like that. Now it makes sense when doing a force analysis with circular motion to make the axes point, one of the axes point, in the direction of the acceleration. So I'll make the x-axis point that way. And the y-axis just has to be perpendicular to that. It can point up or down. So the positive axes are in these directions. Now with those axes, let's look at the components of the tension force. I'm going to define the angle that the string makes with the vertical as the angle theta. And that also makes this angle equal to theta because those are these two lines are parallel and those are alternate interior angles. That makes this side equal to T sine theta because that's the side opposite the angle. And this side equal to T cosine theta. Now we're ready to write down that force equation. In the x direction, we have only one force, and that's this one right here, the horizontal component of the tension force. So that's T sine theta. And let's look at the vertical forces, the net force in a vertical direction. We have two forces. We have the vertical component of the tension, which is T cosine theta, and the full weight force, which is the other direction, so it's negative. 
And now let's do some uh, physics and algebra to combine these two equations. First we know that the object is not accelerating vertically. It always stays in the same vertical plane. So F net Y is zero. And we know that F net X is the mass times the acceleration of the object by Newton's second law. So let's write down two equations, ma equal t sine theta from f net x. And from the second equation for y, I'm going to bring the mg over to the left-hand side and have mg equal t cosine theta. Now, we want to solve these to get rid of the tension force because we don't have a way of directly measuring the tension force. Uh, well, it's easy to solve them that way. We just divide one equation by the other. So we'll have ma over mg equal t sine theta over t cosine theta. The m's will cancel and the t's will cancel. And what we're left with is a over g equal sine theta over cosine theta. Now there's an identity that says the sine theta over cosine theta is equal to the tangent of theta. So the final result, taking the g to the right-hand side, is g tangent theta. So the acceleration of the airplane, which is directed toward the center of the circle, is g tangent theta. Now that's a centripetal acceleration, so that means it's also possible to express the acceleration as the square of its, uh, the magnitude of its velocity divided by the radius of its circular path. And finally, to solve for v, taking the r to the right-hand side and taking the square root. The magnitude of the airplane's velocity, its speed, is the square root of acceleration due to gravity times the radius of the path times the tangent of the angle that the string makes with the vertical. So this is one method that we'll use to find the uh, speed. Uh, we'll need to know what the radius of the path is and what the angle is. Uh, now, let's think about how we're going to find those things out. What I measured uh, before was the length of the string. Well, that's the hypotenuse of this triangle right here, okay? Uh, in order to get the angle and the radius, then, and the radius is right here, what we're going to measure is this height. So you see there's a right triangle right here. So if we know what this length is, and if we know what the height of the triangle is, then it's possible to use trigonometry to calculate the value of the angle theta and to use the Pythagorean theorem or trigonometry, either one, to calculate the value of the radius of the path. So we can know all the numbers that we need in order to calculate the speed of the airplane with this method. Now for the other method of determining the speed, let's look at this from uh, the top view. This would be the view of someone looking down on the path of the airplane. So. Here it looks like a circle, and the radius of the path is r. The uh, speed of the airplane is v. Now this method is particularly simple. It's just a matter of determining how far the airplane goes in a particular amount of time. Now we're going to use the formula that speed equal distance, change in distance over change in time. Since this is a circular path, we can use a special formula for the change in distance. We can just use the circumference of the path and the time it takes to go around once. C for circumference, T for the period of the motion. Now from geometry, we know that the circumference is 2 pi times the radius. So this just results in this formula that the speed is equal to 2 pi times the radius of the path divided by the uh, time it takes to go around once, which is uh, the period t. So this will give us a second measurement for speed, and we'll be able to compare this then to the first measurement, which used Newton's laws, and see how well they compare. They should come out to be about the same. Here we are again with the airplane going around in a circle. We need to measure two things, the vertical height and the time it takes the airplane to go around. We already have one other measurement that we need, and that is the length of the string. So to get the vertical height, I'm going to take my meter stick and just put it up to the side here and bring it in as close to the airplane as I can. And you can see on the meter stick uh, about where the airplane passes it. 
Zero is at the ceiling, and so that tells you the vertical distance that the airplane is below its point of support. Now, in order to get the time measurement, you can simply do that with your real player window because you have a time display in the real player. So what you'll do is watch the airplane and count the number of rotations. I'd say you should count a total of 10 rotations. And when you begin counting at zero, note the time in the real player window. And then note the time again after you count to your 10th rotation. And so you could take the total time and divide it by 10, and that will give you the period. So this gives you all the measurements that you need in order to calculate the speed of the airplane using the two methods that we just Today we're going to look at some demonstrations involving the concept of rotational inertia. Now first of all, let's review the concept of inertia. Inertia is a property that we associate with an object that deals with a resistance to a change in its state of motion. That particular property is the mass of the object. Now rotational inertia is a property that deals with the resistance of an object to a change in a state of rotational motion. That does depend upon the mass of the object, but it depends upon something else as well. And we're going to find out by looking at some demonstrations. Now the first one is one that you've probably played around with before, and that's balancing a pole on your fingers. It's actually fairly easy to do this. You just make small corrections with your hand, and you can keep the uh, pole balanced. Now it stays balanced because of something else that we learned in a previous demonstration, and that is that by moving my fingers, I'm keeping the center mass of the pole directly over the point of support. As long as I do that, it's not going to fall. All right, now let's make it even easier. I'm going to do that by putting a clamp near one end of the, of the pole. This will increase the mass of the pole quite a bit, but it will do something else that we're going to see. Now here's a question. Will it be easier to balance this <coughs> at the weighted end or close to the weighted end or with the weighted end far from the point of support? Well, let's try it both ways. With the weight close to the point of support, or the axis of rotation, I can balance it, but I have to make very big movements with my hand in order to do that. That's because the pole is moving very quickly, and so I have to respond very quickly. It's a lot easier if I do it this way. I don't have to, the motions that I make with my hand to keep it uh, balanced are much slower, and, it's, uh, and that's because the pole has a tendency to rotate much slower. Why is that? It's because the rotational inertia of the pole is greater when I balance it like this than when I balance it like this. Now the mass hasn't changed. What has changed is where the mass is. As it turns out, the further the mass is distributed from the axis of rotation, the greater the rotational inertia that it has, and therefore the greater the resistance to a change in a state of rotational motion. Let's look at another example of that. This one is sort of similar to what you may have seen some circus performers do, and that is balancing stacks of plates on a long pole. Now, I'm not going to try that, but I'm going to balance something on this uh, platform. First of all, you can see that it's fairly easy to balance even as it is, but it should be even easier if I put extra mass far from the point where I'm supporting it. So I'm going to put these sawed off soda pop bottles filled with water on the top and balance it on my fingers. And I can just stand here and this is fairly easy to do. Now my cameraman is pretty nervous right now because he's wondering if I'm going to drop this on his camera. But actually I'm just exaggerating. I can do pretty much with this what I want to do. I just have to be careful when I bring it back down again because that's the point where I'm most likely to tip the thing over and drop it. That's because I had moved the point of support from far from the mass to close to the mass where it's more difficult to keep it balanced. 
Some other examples of this that you may have seen, or one example of this you may have seen, is another circus performer, the tightrope walker. Uh, the tightrope walker uh, uses a long pole which extends way out. Now what this does is actually a couple of things. It uh, increases his rotational inertia because there's a lot of mass far from him. And so uh, when he makes, in order to correct his any slight motions one way or the other, it's fairly easy to do because uh, with a greater rotational inertia, he tends not to rotate very quickly. The other thing it does relates to something that we've studied before, and that is the position of the center of mass. You probably noticed that these poles are very long and they droop way down on the ends. As a result, they pull the center of mass of the man and the pole downward. Uh, and you know from what we learned before that by bringing down the center of mass, that increases the stability of the system. We're going to look at a couple more demonstrations of rotational inertia. Now to review, rotational inertia is the property of an object that deals with a, a resistance to a change in its state of rotational motion. We know that this depends upon the mass of the object and the way that mass is distributed from the axis of rotation. For the first demonstration, let's look at this aluminum disc. This has quite a bit of inertia because much of the mass is distributed far from the axis of rotation. We're going to put this in motion with a motor and let it spin while we're doing something else. Um, and it will take some time to spin down because of its large inertia or rotational inertia. So I'll get this thing going. I'll let it spin up here for about five to 10 seconds. And I've turned the motor off now and now it's just slowing down. Now it will slow down because there's frictions in the bearings. But it's gonna take a while to do that because of its large rotational inertia. While that's happening, let's take a look at this demonstration right here. Here I've got uh, two disks which have the same uh, radii. One of, is, one of them is an aluminum ring, and the other is uh, a piece of wood. Now if these have the same mass, they have the same inertia, but they don't have the same rotational inertia because that mass is distributed in a different way. For this, the mass is distributed uniformly throughout. For the ring, the mass is all distributed far from where the axis of rotation will be, which is going to be right through the center. And so this will have uh, a greater rotational inertia than this wooden disc. What we're going to have them do is race down this incline. And the one with the greater rotational inertia will lose the race because it will have a greater resistance to a change in its state of rotational motion. Now right now the state of rotational motion of both objects is zero. They're not rotating. Once I remove the piece of wood, uh, one of them is going to rotate more quickly. Let's see which one that is. So the wooden disc rotated more quickly and won the race down the incline. That makes sense because we said that the metal ring had greater rotational inertia, so there's a greater resistance to a change in its state of motion. It's going to have a smaller rotational acceleration as it goes down the plane. Let's take a look now at our disk. You can see that it's still turning. It's slowing down and it's almost stopped by now. Um, but if we could make the friction in the bearings much, much less, this could continue spinning for a long period of time. Um, if we made this a very large metallic disk, uh, we could store a large amount of energy, rotational energy, in that disk and we could keep that energy stored for a long period of time. Such devices are called flywheels and they are used uh, for exactly for that purpose, for energy storage. Here is an activity in which we'll examine static friction as a cause of circular motion. For our equipment, we'll be using a motor which has a metal disc attached to it. If I turn on the motor, it will rotate up to some maximum speed. I'm going to turn it off now and place a penny on the disc. Now if I turn on the disc, we would expect the penny to move in a circular path, at least for a while, but at some point, if the disc got to moving fast enough, the penny would slide off. Let's take a look at that.
What determines how fast the disk has to be rotating before the penny slides off? Let's define some quantities first. The penny, which has mass m, is located a distance r from the center of the turntable. When the disk starts rotating, the penny moves at velocity v in a direction tangent to the circular path. By Newton's first law, the normal tendency of any object is to move in a straight line unless a net external force acts on the object. The force acting on the penny to make it move in a circle is static friction between the penny and the disk. This force points to the center of the circle. The net horizontal force acting on the penny when it's moving at constant speed is just the static friction pointing to the center. By Newton's second law, the net force is the product of the mass and acceleration of the penny. The acceleration is a centripetal acceleration. It points toward the center of the circular path and has a magnitude equal to the square of the penny speed divided by the radius of the path. As the disk speeds up, the penny's centripetal acceleration increases. A greater net force is required to keep the penny moving in a circle. The static friction increases to provide that force. The static friction cannot increase without limit. The limit is determined by the weight of the penny and the coefficient of static friction between the penny and the disk. When the limit is reached and exceeded, the friction force can no longer hold the penny in a circular path. This is when the penny slides. Actually, you could think of this as the disk sliding out from under the penny. Now here's a problem for you to do. Suppose I take three pennies, place them at different distances from the center. When I turn the motor, in what order will the pennies slide off? Or will they all slide off at the same time? The key to answering the question is to consider or to rank the pennies according to the amount of centripetal force required to hold them in circular motion at a radius r at a given frequency. Work on your answer, then submit it together with your explanation. After you've submitted it, you'll receive a link to a video clip to see what actually happens. We're going to look at two kinds of friction, static and kinetic friction. Now, here's an example of kinetic friction. If I push this brick, it slides across the table, obviously, and comes to a stop. Something is bringing it to a stop. We take that to be a friction force. Now, since the brick is moving, that's called sliding friction, or another word for it is kinetic friction. Now, a characteristic of kinetic friction force is that the force always acts opposite the direction the object is moving. So the object, the brick moves this way, the kinetic friction force is that way. All right, let's take a, a look at another kind of friction force. This one has to, an example of this one is the force between uh, the tires of a car and the road. Let's get this car going. Now the force that pushes the car along the road, forward along the road, is a friction force. Now that may seem like a strange thing to say. After all, isn't it the engine that moves the car? Well, you certainly need the engine in order to move the tires, but you need the road in order to move the car. Uh, to see why that's tr true, suppose I turn on the engine. But with no road, it doesn't go anywhere. The tires simply spin. The road provides the friction. What's actually happening when the tires are in contact is that the tires are pushing backward on the road, and the road is pushing forward on the tires. This is an action-reaction pair of forces that acts according to Newton's third law. So tires push back on the road, road pushes forward on the car, or on the tires. 
And that push force is a friction force. And in this case, we call it a static friction force. We use the word static uh, because static implies no motion. Now, it's not that the car isn't moving. It certainly is. But the wheels are not slipping along the roadbed, at least not in normal operation. Now, here's another example of static friction. Let me put an object on this brick. If I tilt the brick a little bit, the object stays there. Well, what keeps it there? It's a static friction force. There's no motion between the bar and the brick. Now, if I tilt it enough, the bar begins to move. And so the static friction force became a kinetic friction force at that particular point. One more example of static friction force has to do with uh, the force uh, required for us to walk. In order to walk across the floor, the floor has to push you forward. It's a static friction force. What's happening is that your shoes are pushing backward on the floor, and the floor is pushing forward on you. Again, if that seems strange, just imagine that there were no friction between you and the floor. Uh, maybe it's an icy surface, or maybe you're walking on ball bearings. In that case, you simply slip and fall. You don't go anywhere. Uh, so you can try as hard as you want, but you're not going to move. So you've got to have that static friction force between your feet and the ground in order to move. So static friction is necessary for human locomotion, at least the kind that we normally do. In this demonstration, we're looking at Newton's first law. Newton's first law states that an object continues in its state of rest or uniform velocity unless acted on by a net external force. Now, this may seem counterintuitive to you. <clears throat> if I take a brick, I have to push on it to get it moving in the first place. So it would seem like its natural state of motion to be a, to, is to be at rest. Or once I get it started moving, it very quickly comes to a stop. So again, it seems like it's trying to main, remain at rest rather than in a state of constant velocity. Uh, but what we want to do today is look at this in terms of forces which are acting on it uh, to uh, either resist an increase in its velocity or to cause it to decrease in velocity. And that force, of course, we're talking about is friction. This brick has a lot of friction <laughs> acting on it. Friction acts opposite the direction of motion. So if I push the brick and it moves this way, the friction of the table on the brick will act this way on it. And it actually serves as an unbalanced force which causes it to decrease velocity and eventually come to a stop. Let's do that one more time. So to show that friction really is the culprit in this case, what we need to do is reduce the friction and uh, see what the results are. I can do that by using a cart with wheels on it and put the brick on the cart. Now when I give it a push, first of all, it was easier to get it started in the first place, but it also went further. Now, it did slow down. Take another look at that. But not nearly as much or as quickly as it did uh, when the brick was directly on the table. Now, I can reduce the friction even more by using a cart that has uh, special low friction wheels. And I'll put the brick on it. I'll have to put it sideways on this small cart. Give it a push. It doesn't take much of one. And it just seems to keep going with the uh, velocity that I originally gave it. So here, friction is almost zero. And the object continues. Once, once I uh, push the object and it reaches a particular velocity, then it remains at that velocity, or very nearly so, uh, because I have removed the friction, which would be an unbalanced force acting on it this way. Okay. Let's extend our argument further, as far as we can go. In front of me is an air track. It has a row of holes, actually four rows of holes along the track. And when I turn on the air supply, it will force the air out. And so this glider will ride on a cushion of air, much as a uh, puck would ride on a hockey, on an air hockey table. Uh, now, without the air coming out, you can see that there's a lot of friction. If I give the glider a push, it very quickly comes to a stop. Now, I'm going to turn the air on, and we'll see what happens. <laughs> Thank you.
So you can see that the glider traveled a lot further and in fact didn't come to a stop in, in, until I actually brought it to a stop. Now there is a little bit of friction even with the air coming out and if the track is tilted slightly that would also either accelerate or decelerate the cart. Uh, but I think you can see that without, uh, by reducing the friction as much as possible, the cart uh, continues its motion. In the last series of demonstrations, we tried to reduce the horizontal force as much as we possibly could so that there would be no horizontal force acting on the object. In that particular case, it would continue to move at constant velocity. So what we did was make the friction smaller and smaller. In this case, we're going to look at a car, and cars generally have lots of friction. They have a lot of friction with the road. After all, they need that in order to keep moving. So for this particular car, we're going to arrange for it to move at a constant velocity um, simply by turning on the motor. Now, why did it move at a constant velocity? Well, according to Newton's first law, the net force acting on it must have been zero. That uh, net force is composed of two parts. There is a force, a friction, that is resisting its motion. It acts like this. But there is also a force pushing forward. Uh, and that results from the motor, and that propels the car this way. Those two forces are opposite in direction, but equal in magnitude, and as a result, they add up to zero. So the net force acting on the car is zero. As a result, it will move at constant velocity. Uh, to continue our demonstrations on Newton's first law, we're going to look at a little bit different situation. We're going to look at the uh, forces experienced by a passenger in a car. Now, you've all had the experience of being in a car, and the car suddenly speeds up or suddenly slows down. And we tend to describe those experiences uh, in terms of the way that we're feeling. But what we need to do is look at them from the point of view of a passenger on the ground. A uh, passenger on the ground has what we call an inertial point of view. And this is the point of view in which Newton's laws are valid. So Newton's first law to review says that an object continues in a state of constant velocity unless acted upon by net external force. All right, let's uh, apply this to a car. Now for a car, we're going to use this uh, laboratory cart. And we need to have a windshield on it. Uh, and so we've got this plastic pie plate that's taped to the front of it. And we need a passenger, so we're going to use this troll. And we'll put the passenger right there. Now first of all, we'll look at the situation where we uh, apply a force on the cart to accelerate it. So we're going to push the cart this way to begin with. And we want to see what uh, happens to the passenger. Now, uh, I'm going to go ahead and demonstrate this once, and then we're going to talk about it. Now, you need to have a reference point so that you can see what the troll is doing with respect to that reference point. So I'm going to use my hand here. Again, remember, I'm, obs I'm an observer standing on the ground. Okay, I'm an inertial observer. So here's my hand, and I'm going to push the cart, and I want you to watch where the troll moves with respect to my hand. Watch the feet, and watch the head. Here it goes. <laughs> Let's do that one more time. I hope you noticed that the troll was always in front of my uh, in front of my hand. It did not. The troll did not fall behind my hand. What I'm trying to do is uh, do away with the notion that the troll is somehow thrown backwards or forced backwards. Instead, the troll is being pulled forward. If you notice the feet. The feet moved ahead of the rest of the body, OK? That's because the force of the friction of the cart surface on the feet were pulling it forward. So the force on the troll was that way. Now, as the feet were pulled this way, the head and the shoulders tended to remain where they were. After all, an object tends to re remain in a state of rest unless acted on by a net external force. So the head and shoulders tended to stay where they were while a net external force pulled the feet forward, and the result was that the troll's feet were pulled out from under it. Now we're going to look at the other side of the situation, namely what happens when the car comes to a quick stop. Uh, we often say that the passenger is thrown forward. 
when in fact, from our point of view as an observer on the ground, that is not happening because we know from Newton's first law that an object continues moving at constant velocity unless acted on by a net external force. In the case of the passenger, uh, there is no force on the passenger pushing it forward. Uh, let's take a look at that. This time what we're going to do is crash the cart into this brick. And so when the brick hits, of course, there will be a force acting on it, bringing it to a stop. But there is no force acting on the troll. So the troll should continue moving forward, and in fact, will move forward until it hits the windshield. Let's take a look at that. Now here I want to push this so that the troll doesn't, uh, so the troll stays on its feet for the whole trip. So I'm not going to push quite as hard as I did uh, last time. Okay, let's take a look at that one more time. Okay. What happens again is that the cart comes to a stop and turns around because the brick is exerting a force on it to do that, but the troll continues moving in a state of constant velocity at least until it comes into contact with the windshield, and then the windshield exerts a force on it to bring it to a stop. Now to show that a little bit more dramatically, I'm going to take the windshield off. And you might guess what's going to happen to the troll this time. When the cart hits the wall, the, call, uh, the troll will simply keep going. And actually falls over the front of the cart. Let's see that one more time. So what we've seen in this series of demonstrations is that from our point of view as inertial observers, objects continue to move at constant velocity or remain in their state of rest unless acted on by net external force. According to Newton's first law, an object continues in its state of rest or uniform velocity unless acted on by an external unbalanced force. In this demonstration, we're going to look at the first part of that, uh, namely that an object continues in its state of rest unless acted on by an external unbalanced force. For the demonstration, we'll use this equipment, a glass flask and a wooden hoop, and I'll begin by balancing the hoop on the flask. The object that we're going to uh, experiment with will be the top of my uh, uh, ballpoint pen here. And I'm going to begin by balancing that on the hoop. Now because the uh, pen cap is balanced on the hoop, then we know it's directly above the mouth of the flask. Now the goal is to get the cap to drop directly down into the flask. And we can do this if we use Newton's first law correctly. So you watch what I do very carefully. Now I'm going to do that again, and I'm going to do it the wrong way, and we're going to compare and see what's going on. Okay, watch again. That time the cap flipped up into the air. Now let's see what was different about those two methods. You may have noticed that the first time when I grabbed the hoop, I grabbed from the inside. And the second time, I grabbed from the outside. When I grabbed from the inside, what happened was this. I grabbed quickly enough that the hoop deformed. And when it deforms, it pulls out. And you may notice that the top and bottom of the hoop are coming down. Well, what this means is that the top of the hoop will retract from the pin. And because it retracts from it immediately, there's no way that the hoop can exert any force on the pin cap. As a result, the hoop comes out very quickly. The pin cap simply falls straight down. Now, it's acted, by an, on an, it's, it's acted on by an external force, the force of gravity, but that is the only thing, and so it falls straight down into the flask. There's no horizontal force on it, which would make it go one way or the other. Well, let's see that one more time.
You've probably all seen the parlor trick where a tablecloth is pulled out from under dishes. We're going to try that here, except uh, we're going to do it on a smaller scale. For the dishes, we're just going to have a glass of water. And for the tablecloth, we're going to have this paper tag. Uh, I'll place, place the dish on top of the tag. Now, because you've seen this before, you know that in order to make this work, I have to pull the tag very quickly. So just keep your eye on this. This is often explained as a demonstration of the principle of inertia. However, there's much more to it than that. If I pull slowly, the glass moves right along with the tag, and I can pull it right off the edge of the table. Now, even when I pull the tag quickly, the glass will move some. Watch closely. So the tag shifted toward the table or rather the glass shifted toward the table when the tag was pulled out. Now let's review the physics of this. I pulled on the tag with a fairly large force. I was pulling on a small mass because the tag has a very little mass. As a result, the acceleration of the tag was quite high because the acceleration is equal to the force divided by the mass. Force is large, mass is small. Gives you a large acceleration. On the other hand, the glass was being acted on by a relatively small force of friction but it has much more mass than the tag does. So in that case, we had a small force and a large mass, and that gave a small acceleration. So as a result of the smaller acceleration of the glass compared to the tag, in the same amount of time, the glass didn't move nearly as far as the tag did. And as long as I'm pulling quickly, I can make that happen. Now, let's uh, go a little bit further with this and see what happens if we have a second glass on top of the first. Now, if this were strictly a demonstration of inertia, one might say, well, more mass means more resistance to a change in motion, and this would be easier. But there's something else going on here. As you know, because the glass moves, and this is a tower, and it's an unstable tower, it could easily topple. So if I'm going to be successful in pulling the tag out, I have to pull very quickly. So I'm going to get ready by, putting, by pulling the tag right to the edge, and then I want to pull very quickly and be sure to pull down rather than up because the slightest upward motion will topple that tower of wine glasses. Here we go. Now, we were successful with that, so uh, why not go with one more glass? You've probably seen the demonstration of a tablecloth pulled out from underneath uh, dishes. Uh, if you pull the tablecloth quickly enough, the dishes stay there. Now, this demonstration is similar to that, but instead of dishes, we have a stack of wooden disks. And instead of a tablecloth, we have a stick. And the goal is to remove the disks from the stack. There are eight of them. And to remove them from the stack one at a time from the bottom up without making the stack topple over. Here's how to go about doing it. To get the bottom disc out, just hit it very quickly with the stick. Now, I could hit it slowly, but if I do that, the whole stack moves. Or a little bit faster, and the stack may topple over. What's happening here is that when I hit the stick, I'm hitting it with a fairly large force. And I'm, that force is acting on that disc on the bottom. So I have a large force acting on a fairly small mass. Now you know that acceleration is equal to force over mass. And so uh, we have large force over small mass equal large acceleration. When I have the whole stack there, let's talk about the force and acceleration of the stack that is above the bottom disk. Why does that stack move at all? If I move slowly, you can see it does move. It moves because the bottom disk is exerting a force of friction on the stack. Now that's a relatively small force compared to the force that I uh, exert on the stick. That small force is accelerating a fairly large mass. So in that case, we have acceleration equals small force over large mass, so we get a small acceleration. So as a result, when I hit quickly, 
The bottom disk acquires a large acceleration, while the stack of disks above it require, acquires a small acceleration. Uh, the acceleration, the forces act for the same period of time for both. As a result, the bottom disk speeds up much more than the top does, and we're able to get the bottom disk out. And we can just keep going back and forth and get rid of the whole stack that way. This is a simple demonstration you can do at home to show the independence of vertical and horizontal motion. All you need for it is a tabletop and two pennies, or two coins of any kind. Place one coin right on the edge of the table, so it's just teetering, and place the other coin. What you're going to do with the other coin is flip it with your finger so that it just grazes the first one, and the first one will drop at the same time that the second one is projected off the table. Um, the question is, uh, when will they hit? Which one, of, which one of the coins will hit first, or will they hit at the same time? Let's go ahead and try this and see what happens. OK, if you were listening to the sound, you probably heard only a single sound when they hit. They hit at the same time. Let's do that one more time. Oh, why do they hit at the same time? Even though one coin has to travel a further distance to get to its target. Well, again, it's because the uh, horizontal and vertical motions are independent of each other. The objects fall at the same rate because they are both influenced by the acceleration due to gravity. And because they fall at the same rate and the horizontal motion has no influence, this means that since they fall the same distance, they must take the same amount of time. Now, it might help to understand why the projected penny falls further than the drop penny in the same amount of time if you think of it like this. At any instant of time, the projected penny has a downward velocity component like this, and this is due to gravity. Now, the drop penny also has the same velocity vector at the same instant of time. However, the projected penny also has a horizontal velocity component due to the flip that I gave it initially. The overall velocity vector of the projected penny is therefore diagonal to the two components and has a magnitude that is greater than either of the components. So the average velocity of the projected penny is greater than that of the drop penny. With a greater average velocity, the projected penny will obviously travel a greater distance in the same amount of time than the drop penny will. In this demonstration, we'll see that the vertical and horizontal motions of a projectile do not influence each other. Uh, the projectile that we'll use is this uh, plastic ball, and we'll project it with this cannon. This cannon, uh, this device has a spring in it, and I'll just hold it here so you can see it. And I can force the spring down, and it will stay in place there. So the spring is compressed at this point. I'll push the cart along this level track, now my table's not quite level, so I put some cardboard here uh, to make sure that it was level. So you can see the cart doesn't move uh, on the track. Uh, the other thing that I need is to release the ball, and for that purpose I have an automatic release, which is a photogate. And the photogate is this device on the side, which has a slot in it. There's an infrared beam passing across it. If I break that infrared beam with something, then that will release the ball. What I'll break it with is this piece of cardboard. So I'm going to mount this cardboard on this clamp right here at exactly the level of the photo gate. And double check. Now when I pass it through, let me just show you how this works. When I pass it through the photo gate, it releases the ball. So I'll get the flag in position, line it up, and we're set to go. Ready the cart. I'll give a push and I'll stop pushing before the uh, flag uh, actually passes through the photo gate. And as you can see, the ball fell right back down into the cannon. Let's take another look at that. Ready? 
right back down in the can and before I actually caught it over here. So what that is showing us is that the ball continues traveling horizontally with the same speed that the cart has. The cart doesn't slow down, the ball doesn't slow down, and since they're both moving horizontally together, the ball comes right back down in the cart. And the fact that gravity was acting on the ball all the time and making it slow down on the way up and speed up on the way down had absolutely no effect on that horizontal motion. This will be an experiment to measure the speed of sound. Now we know that speed is the change in distance over the change in time. So our method is going to be to measure how far sound travels in a certain amount of time, and then take the distance it traveled and divide it by the amount of time. Now the way this experiment is usually done uh, is over a much greater distance than we're going to be using in the laboratory here. For example, you might, use, uh, you might station people at opposite ends of a football field. And at one end of the field, you have somebody smashing two trash can lids together. And at the other end of the field, you have someone uh, with a stopwatch who times how long it takes from when that person sees the trash can lids actually contact each other to when they actually hear the sound. And there is a noticeable time delay there. Now, since we are just going to be working over the space of this table, we don't have those long distances. We're going to have a much shorter period of time which you won't be able to use a stopwatch. We'll have to use a different way to measure the time, but we will be able to do that successfully. Here's some of the equipment that we'll be using. Uh, one piece is this flash unit. This is just a standard flash that you might put on top of a camera. Let's give it a flash here. This device is not quite so standard. It's a sound actuated trigger. It's composed of a microphone right here. Inside is a little audio amplifier, and the way it works is I'll turn it on here, and when it receives a sound, it automatically sets off that flash. Okay, and we have two of those. Over here is another flash with its own sound trigger. I'll turn that one on. Okay. Now here's basically the plan of the experiment. If I stand right here and produce a sound, it will set off this flash first because it reaches this microphone first. And then the sound will take some time to travel along here, and it will set off the second one. Let's try that right now. You keep an eye on the two flashes. Once more. Now, I'm sure you couldn't tell that there was a time delay between those two flashes. The time interval is just too short. So that means we're going to have to have another piece of equipment in order to measure that short time interval. So I'll show you that piece of equipment next. This is the device that I'll use to measure the short time intervals that we're going to have in this experiment. Now there's nothing special about it. It uh, used to be a fan, one of these clip fans that clipped to the table. I took off the fan blades and replaced it with this uh, cardboard disc painted black with a white line on it. And you can think of this as a high speed clock. And so the white line is the hand of our clock and let's see how fast it goes. It goes so fast that normally you can't actually see it turning. But with the flashes, we will be able to see the line at a particular instance of time. Let's see that right now. So I'll begin by turning the flashes around now to face the disk. I'll turn on this trigger. And you can see that when the flash goes off, you get a very sharp image of the line on the disk. And that's because this flash is only lasting about a 30,000th of a second. Let me turn the other one on. And now if I make a sound right here, you'll see two images of a hand on the clock. And that's because uh, when the sound reaches this microphone, the flash goes off and you get one image. And then time passes and it reaches the other microphone and that flash goes off and you get the second image and the disc will have turned during that time far enough so that you can uh, see the angle between them. And that angle we will find will be a measure of the amount of time that passed from one sound, from one sound trigger to the other one. Now, in order to use uh, the clock to measure the amount of time, we will need to know the angle between the two uh, images of the clock hand, but we need to know something else. We need to know how fast that clock is turning. To find that out, we'll use a stroboscope and use a method like was shown to you in a previous clip. 
I'm going to set the stroboscope for a frequency of 50 flashes per second because I want to make the disk go around 50 times per second. I've got a variable speed control here, and I'll adjust that. And I get, that should be pretty nearly 50 rotations per second. That's a little bit different, but it's close enough for what we're doing here. It'll change slightly. So now we know the frequency of the motor. I'll make one more addition to the equipment. I'll put colored filters on the flash units. A green filter for the left flash and a red filter for the right flash. The reason for this is that the hand that shows up on the clock for each of the flashes will be a different color and so we'll easily be able to distinguish between the flashes and see which one went off first. Let's just take a look at that. I'll make a sound here and you can see both a red and a green image on the disk. You can also tell which one went off first because the disk is rotating clockwise and when you look at the hands the green one appears in that particular case at about the one o'clock position and the red at about the two o'clock position the red one went off a little bit later because sound had to travel further to reach it. Now to test the triggers to make sure that they respond in the same way I put them both together and make the sound out front so that the sound travels the same distance to each microphone. In that case, the two images of the hand should be on top of each other and they should look neither red nor green but maybe probably white. And you can see that's the case. Now we're ready to do the experiment. I'll begin by placing the left trigger at the 10 centimeter mark on the meter stick and the right trigger at the 70 centimeter mark. That means the distance between them is 60 centimeters. I'll produce a sound with the two blocks out here on the end in line with the two microphones. That's so that the time between the flashes will correspond to the distance between the microphones. Here goes. Now you can see the angle is quite a bit less than the 90 degrees that we're trying to achieve. So what I need to do is move the triggers farther apart. So I'm going to put this one at right in the middle there now at a hundred uh, centimeters. So the distance between them now is 90 centimeters. Here we go again. Still quite a bit less than 90 degrees. Let's make a bigger change. I'll go out to 140 centimeters there, so the distance now is 130 centimeters between sound triggers. Still a little bit less than 90, but we're getting close. Let's try almost the other end of the table, 180. So the difference between them now is 170 centimeters. That looks pretty close to 90 degrees, so let's use those particular results. So our data then is the distance between the sound triggers is 1.70 meters. The angle on the disc is 90 degrees, and the frequency of the disc is 50 flashes per, is uh, 50 rotations per second. So we'll now use that information to calculate the speed of sound. In the last experiment, we measured the speed of sound. We did that by using a high-speed clock to measure short time intervals. In this experiment, we're going to do things just a bit differently. Now that we know the speed of sound, we're going to use that particular value to measure short time intervals. And the short time interval that we're going to measure is the amount of time it takes this balloon to pop. From the instant that I prick the balloon with this pin until the balloon is pretty much completely gone, that's the amount of time that we're going to determine. You might call that the lifetime of a bursting balloon. Uh, the experiment will use some of the same equipment as in the last experiment. A sound trigger connected to this flash unit. And then the two meter sticks that we'll use to measure distance. To begin the experiment, I'll be putting the balloon right here at the zero mark of the meter stick. I'll pop it right at the front. It won't take very long for the sound to travel 
from the point where I prick the balloon to the sound trigger. Uh, in that amount of time, the balloon won't rip very far. It'll still be pretty much an intact balloon. But then I'm going to move the balloon further and further down the meter stick. And the further I move it while keeping the sound trigger in the same place, the longer it will take sound to travel from the balloon to the trigger, and so more time will elapse. About how much time are we talking about? Well, from the last experiment, you probably found that the speed of sound was about 340 meters per second. Now, that's also the same thing as 340 millimeters per millisecond. Now, it's useful to think of it in those units because of the fact that we're going to be dealing with very short time intervals that are on the order of milliseconds rather than seconds. For example, if I move the balloon from the zero mark to about a third of a meter, well, a third of a meter is 33 centimeters, and that's 330 millimeters. If the speed of sound is 340 millimeters per millisecond, that amount of time for sound to travel this far is just about one millisecond. So if, for example, the balloon were, let's say, two-thirds of the way down the meter stick, and we popped it, and we saw that the balloon was pretty much gone at that point, we could say, well, that took about two milliseconds because each third of a, me each third of a meter is a millisecond of time. Okay? So we'll use that in order to figure out the lifetime of this bursting balloon. So let's begin. Uh, we'll do a series of four bursts, one at zero, one at half a meter, and one at one meter, and one at a meter and a half. Uh, and then uh, we'll see what results we get from those. So let's begin with the first one. Here it goes. <coughs> so in the freeze frame, you saw that the balloon had split just a very short distance up the front of it, and that's because the amount of time it took sound to travel from the point of the rip to the microphone on the sound trigger was very short. Next I'll move the balloon, uh, the next balloon, a half a meter down the stick and we'll do it again, but I'm going to move my flash down just a little bit so it's closer, but I'm keeping the sound trigger in the same place. Okay, let's try this one. Well, in that particular shot, uh, you saw that the balloon was ripped completely up the front and actually ripping on the back. So the balloon was about half gone. Uh, let's keep moving on down the meter stick. Well, that time the balloon was pretty much gone, but it still had a little bit of a shape of the balloon. So let's move down another half a meter for the final shot. Well, in that last shot, you can see that the balloon was almost completely gone. There was just a little piece left, and it was completely collapsed. So we can say that the lifetime of a bursting balloon, at least the balloons that I'm using here, is about the amount of time it takes sound to travel a distance of 1.5 meters. So knowing the speed of sound and that distance, you can calculate the amount of time it takes a balloon to burst. The device that I have here is a generator. Uh, let's see what parts it has. I can turn the crank here. When I turn the crank, what it does is turn an armature inside. Now, an armature is a coil of wire that's specially wound, and it turns in a magnetic field. And the purpose, of course, as you know from generators, is to generate electrical current. Now, you can't see the armature inside there, so I'm just telling you about it. Also inside here are uh, a series of gears, and the purpose of the gears are to increase the rate of rotation of the armature compared to the rate of cranking. So I can crank slowly, and I could get a very rapid rotation inside the armature. The output of the generator comes through these two wires, so if I clip this to something external, uh, such as a light bulb, uh, I will get electrical current going through the light bulb. All right. Before I do that, I want to show you another function of this device. This can also act as a motor, which basically acts the reverse as a generator. As a motor, as you know, what we do is we take uh, electrical energy or electrical current, 
and we convert it to mechanical energy of rotation. All right? So to make it work as a motor, I just take my clips and I connect them to a battery. And when I do, current will pass through the armature inside here. That armature is in a magnetic field, so the magnetic field exerts magnetic force on the current, and that produces a torque which turns the crank. So let's see that happen. All right, so that's the motor. All right, um, so let's move the battery pack aside, and now we're going to see it work uh, in the reverse as a generator. So this time I will be inputting mechanical energy of rotation, and the result will be electrical energy as an output. So we'll connect this to a light bulb. And crank away. And a little bit of cranking, you get some uh, light from the bulb, a lot of cranking. The bulb is very bright. So as I crank faster, I was generating greater current. And as you know, the light, uh, the uh, power dissipated by the bulb is the square of the current times the resistance of the bulb. So greater current means greater power dissipation, hence more light. All right. Now there's something else interesting going on with this that you didn't, you couldn't see, but I could feel it, and I want to talk to you about that. When I turn this, I feel a mechanical resistance to my turning. Something is pushing back on my hand, and that depends on what I have connected to the circuit. So if, for example, there is nothing connected to the circuit, this is very easy to turn. If I have the light bulb, it's moderately easy. And if I connect it together, it's very hard to turn. The difference in these three situations is the resistance of the external circuit. Here the external circuit has essentially zero resistance. It's only the wires. Uh, here we had infinite resistance. And here we had maybe about 10 ohms of resistance for that light bulb. All right. So as you know, the amount of resistance is going to influence the amount of current in the circuit. So we had more current when there was less resistance. Now let's examine the uh, um, cause of this mechanical resistance to turning from the viewpoint of something you know about uh, induced, uh, induced electromagnetic fields, and that is Lenz's law. Okay? Lenz's law tells us that an induced EMF gives rise to a current that opposes the original change in flux. All right, so let's see how that applies to our generator right here. All right. As I turn this, I'm producing a current, and that current is passing through the armature. All right? So we have a current that is being moved in a wire through this armature, uh, through this magnetic field. The result of that is an induced EMF. That induced EMF will generate a current which actually opposes the current that I'm producing by turning it. All right? And the result of that opposition is to create a force on the armature which opposes the force which I'm applying to the crank. That appears in the form of a torque, which is called a counter torque. So there's a counter torque opposing the torque or the forward torque of my turning. All right? And that's going to be greater when there's more current in the external circuit. So that's greatest when there's uh, no resistance in the circuit, or essentially zero resistance in the circuit, so that there's the greatest amount of current. And that resistance, that counter torque, is least when the uh, resistance is infinite and there's no current in the outer circuit. We're going to be looking at the forces that you typically encounter in solving force problems. Uh, there are four of them. Those forces are weight, tension, friction, and normal. Every object has weight. The weight is due in this particular case for this brick. The weight of the brick is due to the earth pulling on it. Uh, and the nature of that force is that it is directed vertically downward and uh, directly toward the center of the earth. Another kind of force is tension. And tension force you can think of as a springy force. Here you can see the spring coils get further apart. It's obvious that a force is being exerted here. 
the nature of the tension force is that it always acts along the line of the uh, spring, or it could be a string or a wire, and it's always the same amount in each part of the medium. Uh, Bungee Man over here experiences a tension force, and that tension force is along the line of the spring that is supporting him. So uh, as I pull, you can see the spring coils get further apart. That's a sign that more force is being exerted to pull Bungee Man back up again. For strings, there are tension forces. It's not so obvious that the string is stretching, but if you stretch it hard enough, you can actually feel it stretch. And if you've ever messed with fishing line uh, or thread, you can certainly feel those stretching if you pull them hard enough. A third kind of force is friction. We're going to leave that one as a separate topic to discuss in another video. So that leaves us with the fourth force, the normal force. This is a name that we give to forces that are exerted by solid surfaces, such as this table. When I put the brick on the table, we say that the table pushes up on the brick and supports it, and we call that a normal force. The reason we call it normal is that uh, we're using normal in a different sense than one usually encounters, and that is in the sense of being perpendicular. Normal is a mathematical term for perpendicular. So the normal force on the brick is exerted uh, perpendicular to the brick. That means if we put the brick on a slanted surface, the force will no longer be directly upward. On this inclined plane, the force on the brick is off at an angle right here perpendicular to the plane. If I raise the plane all the way up to 90 degrees, at that point there would be no more normal force exerted on it. There would be nothing pushing. If the brick were here and the plane were here, there would be nothing uh, uh, pushing on the brick this way. Now, normal force is uh, can be a difficult concept to understand. Let's talk about it from two different points of view. First, from a theoretical point of view, we know that an object which is, which, which is at rest has no net force acting on it. Uh, so the brick is at rest here. We say that the sum of all the forces acting on it is zero. Well, one of those forces we've already said is the weight which points down. Well, if all the forces on it act up to zero, it means there must be a force acting up to balance the weight. And that is, in fact, what we call the normal force. Now, if you're not satisfied with a the theoretical description, we'll try to do it in a, um, a little bit uh, different way to try to actually explain what's going on with the surface. Because the table looks like it's doing nothing. How can something that's doing nothing exert a force? Uh, well, one way to see this is, let's put a, a pad right there and put the object on the pad. Now, I don't know if you can tell, but the uh, brick pushes down a little bit on the pad and actually compresses it. If you have enough weight, you can see the compression in the pad. The more weight, the more compression. Um, it's sort of like a spring, where you stretch more on a spring, you have more force required to do that. Let's put a lead brick. This brick is covered in tape, but it's very heavy, and you can see that it presses quite a bit. So the fact that the pad is pressed so much means that the, the pad is exerting quite a bit of force. Uh, the scales that you step on in a bathroom scale, for example, uh, work the same way. The heavier you are, uh, the more you compress a spring inside and the larger, reading, the larger the reading on the scale is. Now, what you need to think of is that this table is actually acting like a spring or a cushion in the same way. Well, not quite the same. It's a much stiffer cushion. Um, think of it, there are lots of little atoms in there, and those atoms, think of them as holding hands or as having very strong bonds between them. And um, those bonds, while they're very strong, they can be stretched. And if you put a heavy enough weight on them, uh, uh, well, actually, if you put any weight on them uh, whatsoever, there will be a very small amount of displacement. You might think of it as a fireman's net that is stretched so tight that you can hardly see the, the stretch in the net when uh, something lands on it. Uh, same thing with the table here, except it's even uh, stretched more tightly than that. Now, if we put enough weight on the table, we could we could see the amount of the compression in the table. You can probably imagine if we put an extremely heavy weight, like a safe, we could make the table buckle under that weight. Uh, now with an object called an optical lever, we can see extremely small displacements, so we don't have to put a safe on the table. Uh, we can just put a small force on it, and we can see the table actually uh, deform in re in, in, uh, or move in response to that. And that's what we'll do next. We'll move to the classroom in order to see the demonstration of the optical lever. This is a setup to 
magnify very small motions in objects. Uh, for example, we're going to actually be looking at the motions of this uh, concrete supporting column. This column actually goes down into the basement of the building four stories below us. So it's very sturdy and very difficult to move. I have an aluminum bar here which is attached to the wall with this piece of clay. And the bar rests at the other end on a, just a steel block. Now between the block and the bar I'm going to put this pin. Now to the pin is glued a mirror, just a small piece of a mirror, and that slips right in between the bar and the block. And because uh, it's a, uh, the needle is uh, cylindrical, it rotates easily underneath it. What's going to happen is that as either the table moves or the uh, supporting beam moves, that the uh, needle is, uh, those motions are going to be transmitted to the needle, which, are going, which is going to move back and forth, and so the needle will move back and forth. Now they're going to be very tiny, in order to detect them, we need to amplify them. And to do that, we're going to use a device called an optical lever. That just requires a, a beam of light that reflects off of the mirror and goes to a distant screen. For a beam of light, we're going to use this laser beam. So it uh, reflects off the mirror surface right here. And then it reflects back this way. And about five meters on the other side of the room, there is a screen where we can see the beam. So I'll just, here I'm just going to hit the table real sharply like that. And you can see that this causes the table to actually vibrate because the beam bounces up and down on the screen. Actually, you can see it's bouncing a little bit all the time because there's always vibration in the building. Now, if I'll just push down on it, you can see that the beam goes down a long distance. So although you can't, if you look at the table, you can't see it moving, it obviously must be moving. Uh, and so it is responding to the force that I apply to it. It's exerting a normal force back up on me. Now I'm pushing directly on the column. And you can see that the beam is moving a small distance. Uh, it's not as much as before when I was pushing on the table, which has a lot more give to it. Uh, but it's certainly moving further than just its normal vibration. Now we're on the opposite side of the wall as before. The apparatus is on the other side of the column, which is right here. And so now I'm going to push on it from the opposite side. I'm just going to uh, put my shoulder into it. So we've seen some examples of several types of forces that you will encounter in physics problems. One of them is the force of weight. Another is the tension force, which we see uh, on springs and wires and strings. And a third one uh, is the normal force, the force that surfaces exert perpendicular to objects. A fourth kind of force you will encounter is friction, and that will be the subject of another video clip. What you see here is our version of the State Fair ride, the Giant Swings. Now, this is by no means giant, but they do provide very high accelerations, much higher than the State Fair ride does. For passengers, we're going to use these green-blooded aliens from the planet Jupiter. Now, they can, they're used to experiencing large accelerations because, after all, they come from Jupiter, where the gravitational field is much higher than the Earth. We'll put one passenger on each pan. and put them in motion just by turning the crank. And if you've ever ridden the State Fair ride or watched somebody else ride it, you know that when it spins, the chairs move outward, and the faster it spins, the farther they move. Now, what you're going to be doing is analyzing this situation. You're going to be determining the acceleration of the passengers in two different ways and comparing your results. One method is to simply to use the formula for centripetal acceleration that you've already learned, namely the square of the speed of the object divided by the radius of the path. So you'll need to measure the speed of the passenger and the radius of its path. Now for the radius, take the distance from, say, about the middle of the passenger to the axis of rotation. Now that has to be a perpendicular distance to the axis because the motion, the circular motion, is in a horizontal circle. Now, for the speed, you'll need to know how fast the passenger is going around or how long it takes it to go around once. 
In order to use that, you'll use a video analysis program that we'll talk about again later. The other method is to do a net force analysis. So with the passenger in this position, you'll identify the forces acting on the object. There are two of them. And write the net force equations and solve for the acceleration. Now again, when you set up your net force equations, be sure to pick one of your coordinate axes in the direction of the acceleration. And remember again that that direction is horizontal because the circular path is a horizontal circle. You'll be doing the analysis using a uh, video analysis program and some video clips that we've already prepared in order to get your accelerations in terms of meters per second squared you'll be you'll need to be able to take the distance measurements in pixels that you get from the video program and convert those to meters so to do that I'm going to measure one distance that you can use to obtain your scale factor the distance I'm going to measure is from the inside of one of these uprights to the inside of the other one Okay, now I've positioned the meter stick. What you need to do is make a reading. Read, I would say read from the inside surface of the pole there, and it's good enough to read to the nearest millimeter, the smallest division on the meter stick. So I'll take that reading now and write it down. Now we're going to take a look at the reading on for the other pole. Okay, here's the pole on the right-hand side. Again, I would recommend that you read from the inner surface of the pole there. Take your reading to the nearest millimeter and write it down. And so the distance you'll be interested in is the difference between those two readings. That will be the distance in meters between the inside surfaces of the uprights. So with that information and the physics that you already know, you should be able to calculate the acceleration two different ways and compare. Next, you'll download the instructions for the laboratory and carry it out. Here we're going to be looking at what a spring scale measures. Now you may think, well, that's pretty simple. It just measures weight. But it's not quite that simple. Let's take a closer look. This scale has a spring built into the plastic housing here. When you put a weight on the scale, the spring stretches, and that causes the needle to deflect and give you a reading in terms of newtons. Now the object that we're going to be weighing is this soda pop bottle that we filled with sand. It has a mass of about one kilogram, so its weight should be about 9.8 newtons. And as you can see from the scale reading, it's right around 10 newtons. Now we're going to look at the forces acting on the uh, scale in this situation and go from there. We begin by representing the bottle of sand with a point. There are two forces acting on the bottle. One is the tension force of the scale acting upward. The other is the weight of the bottle of sand acting downward, mg. To set up a net force equation, we need to define a positive direction. Normally that would be in the direction of the acceleration, but in this case the bottle of sand is not accelerating, so we can choose either up or down. I'll choose up for positive. The next step is to write the net force equation, F nat equals. Now the upward force is T, and that will be positive, so I'll write that first. And the downward force is mg and that's negative, so that will be subtracted from T. Now since the object, the bottle of sand, is not accelerating, the net force acting on it is zero, and therefore we can say that the tension force is equal to mg, the weight of the bottle. So in this particular case, the spring scale measures the weight of the bottle. So we've seen that to keep the object and equilibrium, I have to exert a force upward that's equal to the object's weight. Now, you may have noticed that I've, as I've been holding this, the needle has been oscillating back and forth around 10. So, since the needle is reading different things, even while I'm holding the same bottle here, there must be something involved other than just the weight of the bottle. 
that thing has to do with the fact that I can't hold the scale perfectly steady, so I'm exerting small accelerations on it up and down. Let me exaggerate that by pulling the scale up quickly. So I'll give it a quick upward acceleration. You watch what the needle does as soon as I pull. Now at the instant I pulled, you saw the needle go up. Now at some point, when I came to a stop, the needle also came to a stop and came back down again. Let's concentrate first on that first part where I did the upward pull. Let me do it one more time. Okay, now we're going to go back and look at the forces there and do a force analysis for this situation. For this situation, we applied a greater tension force in order to achieve an upward acceleration. The net force equation will look the same as it did before because we still have a tension force and a weight force. We still have the direction of positive up, and so F net equal T minus mg. What's different is that the net force is no longer zero because the acceleration is not zero. The net force by Newton's second law is the mass of the object times its acceleration. This is equal to the tension force minus the weight. Solving this for the tension force, we get T equal mg plus ma. So we find that the reading of the spring scale, which is the tension force, in this case is equal to the true weight of the object plus the mass of the object times its acceleration. So what we saw with the force analysis was that the scale reads the tension force. In the case of equilibrium that I have here, that tension force is simply equal to the weight of the object. But when I was accelerating upward, that tension force was equal to the weight of the object, mg, plus the mass of the object times its acceleration, or mg plus ma. We call that the apparent weight of the object. In other words, what the scale measures, the tension force, is the apparent weight. The true weight would be mg. The apparent weight in this case is mg plus the mass of the object times its acceleration. Now let's take a look at the situation where we lower the scale quickly. In other words, we give it a downward acceleration. Watch closely when I do this. Let me do that one more time. All right, what you probably saw was as soon as I started to lower it, the needle moved this way very quickly, so the reading went down. Of course, it came to a stop when I came to a stop and went back the other direction. What I want you to do now is to Work on your papers to do the force analysis for this situation. Set it up like I did the case for the upward acceleration. Draw your forces. Write your net force equation. Remember this time, though, that the acceleration is down instead of up. Therefore, when you pick the direction of positive, pick that direction to be down. Solve for the tension force, and then we'll take a look at what you have. Okay, you've done your force analysis. Uh, you can check it now by comparing it to what we have here. For this situation, the spring scale accelerates downward. The same two forces exist on the scale as before, the weight of the object and the tension, but now the tension force will be less than the weight. Because the acceleration is downward, we'll pick the direction of plus to be down. And so the net force equation is F net equal. The tension force will now be a negative force because plus is down and tension is up. And the weight will be a positive force, again, because it's down and plus is down. Using Newton's second law, Ma equal minus T plus Mg. Rearranging the equation, bringing T over to the left side and Ma to the right side the tension force is mg minus ma. So in this case, the tension force is smaller than the weight of the object. All right, we have one more problem to do with the spring scale. I have a little bit different situation here. Here's the scale. I, haven't tur I have the uh, scale turned away from you because I don't want you to see the reading yet. And uh, instead of me holding it, we have these strings holding it. 
On one side, we have a string going over a set of pulleys to our 10 Newton bottle of sand. This is the same one that we were holding in the uh, last series of demonstrations. On the other side, instead of me holding it, we have a second 10 Newton bottle of sand. So we have two uh, equal forces pulling on either direction on the scale. Each of those forces is 10 Newtons. So your problem is to predict what the scale reading is. Um, is it 10 Newtons? Is it zero? Do the forces subtract from each other? Is it 20 Newtons? Do the forces add to each other? So you make your prediction on the electronic form, write down uh, an explanation for the answer that you give, and then click on the link that you receive in order to come back to the video and see what the answer is. Well, you've submitted your answer. Let's see if you got the right one. Did you say 10 Newtons? This surprises a lot of people, but let's find out why it makes sense. Think back to the situation that I showed you when we first started looking at the scale. I was holding the scale vertically, and I had a 10 Newton bottle of sand on it. Here's the 10 Newton bottle of sand. The only difference between that situation and this is that instead of me supplying an upward force of 10 newtons to hold the scale. This bottle is supplying the force of 10 newtons to hold the scale. So in any case, the force, the scale is being held from moving by a 10 newton force pulling on it. So we have the 10 newton weight that we're measuring, and we have the 10 newton force the other direction, which is holding the scale stationary, and so the reading should be 10 newtons in either case. 